moms are using it during labor. Firefighters are using it. Police officers are using it. Uh, doctors are using it during long surgeries. Um, different people who are going through more serious treatments and have trouble keeping on weight will use that during those treatments. So let's talk superfoods because yes. that's a big thing for you. What are the five superfoods that can help reduce inflammation and enhance our longevity? So I would be remiss if I didn't identify that superfoods will vary from person to person. So when I work with my clients, my athletes, and my entertainers, we will make our best guess when we're starting out with a meal program. And then as we're going through that, we'll do some blood chemistry and then really identify what is going to remain as their superfood and what's going to maybe be taken away. And I have an, a really cool story around that. But I always want to say, you know, superfood is is something when we talk about it, it's a jumping off point for someone to take agency and do a little more research. Just have to say that. I love that. So there's like no one size fits all approach. Absolutely not. One person's superfood can be another person's kryptonite. And that is so important. So wow. when you are learning about superfoods, use that again as a way to start making cha generalized changes right now. And then if you have the means to do some more investigation with like a functional medicine doctor and additional testing or even listening to your body, um, I made a joke, superfoods. If it makes you feel super, keep going. If it makes you feel shitty, maybe it's not your superfood and you shouldn't force yourself to pass a threshold with it. So I think, you know, superfoods are, is a sensitive word for me, but there are foods that are nutrient dense. There are a few foods that we know generally have a positive up uptick in somebody's body. So that's my stepping off the soapbox. Um, well, I love that. And, and also for context, you work with some of the most well-known people in sports, in the entertainment business. So you- Facts. You're, <laughs> facts. So you're a performance chef and you, you basically like you offer your clientele who have some of the most demanding jobs on the planet, right? Foods that are going to enhance their performance, make them feel better, reduce inflammation, show a positive- um, Extend of their career, the longevity of their career. Right. And so it starts with, I, and we can talk about it later, but I do this like gut reset for one week that I end up learning a lot of the, about their body, seeing how they respond during that week to a combination of an elimination diet, calorie restrictive diet, and some fasting. So we learn a lot during that one week, put together a plan, and then follow that up with really specific testing. So it's blood testing, which is available to most people through your primary or functional medicine doctor. But then for our athletes, we do spit testing, stool testing, sweat testing, et cetera. And that's how we drill down because most of my clients are already the greatest. And I have to get them that little edge that makes anything in the way of their, their legacy just get out of the way so they can keep doing what they're doing for as long as possible. I do have a couple of older clients and older athletes that are like the oldest in the league and it's like they're still crushing it. So that's really, really awesome. And that's where it becomes really individual. So no two clients are on the same macro plan and no two clients are on the same micro plan. And, and what I do on my platform is I share what I'm doing with them and then always advise ways for you to take what they're doing on this really detailed level and then stripping it down for the mom, the lawyer, the tech person. Because for me, my trademarks, eat, play, crush, EPC, and performance isn't always about uh, what the human is being, but what is the human doing? And to me, if you have a body, you're performing in some way, and I wanna be able to, for you to reach that full potential. That's amazing. You've really carved like a, a, real, a unique niche for yourself. I mean, a chef that works with doctors. Yeah, yeah. Shout out Andy Galpin, Dan Garner. Mm. I work with sports scientists to do all that that um, validation and all of the the readout of our tests. And again, I've been doing this for ten years. So when I'm sharing something, I'm sharing it because I've I've applied it to clients, and I'm responsible for those recommendations. And so I take it very seriously. And so when I am sharing that, I'm also sharing that I'm not always the smartest person in the room. And sometimes we will accidentally figure something out, like black human seed is something we'll talk about as one of those ingredients. I I was introduced to it as a child. We use it in Egypt, the seeds when we're fermenting lemons, which we know is good for your gut. And it's really good to not, you know, my grandma's like, it won't make you, you won't get sick if you use this. Mm. And I use it as a really powerful anti-inflammatory and performance enhancer as far as making them more stress resistant for my athletes. And then I'm, I'm finding that none of my clients are getting sick or the ones that have um, 
stomach issues that's going away or the ones that were having issues with candida. So then I'm asking the sports scientist, can you, can you help validate why I'm finding this over the course of 10 years? And I'm like, holy crap, this is like, there's so many double blind studies on black human seed oil and it's starting to get more popular now. So a lot of what I do is intuitive to a degree. And it's also like, you can bend the rules when you know the rules. And so I know enough about all these foods and combinations based on experience to be dangerous. And then I can pay attention to either trends among clients that are the same or anomalies and then call that out and then pull in the sports scientist, pull in the functional medicine doctor. And then we also do consulting around performance recovery. And so it's pulling in the PT, pulling in the acupuncture. So I, I'm into Marvel. So it's like we're the performance Avengers and I have a whole team of people that I pull in to make sure we're optimizing on and off the plate. I love it. I mean, and you're the best. I mean, you are. This is a very unique niche that you've carved. But even like among chefs, you're so talented um, and so good at what you do. One of your one of the uh, recipes in my new in my new cookbook, Genius Kitchen, is a recipe that you've created. And it's the recipe that single handedly made me a a lover of liver, which a is believer, a believer, <laughs> a believer. Yeah, I love it. Um, so to be fair, that's the way we make liver in Egypt. It's the way my mother prepared it. My grandmother rep- prepared it. And I've always loved liver. I've had it as like a treat, basically. Mm. And then I, I my American friends tell me they hate liver and I don't totally understand it. And then I go to a friend's house after school and her mom makes liver and onions. And it's like, why is it gray? Why does it taste like this? And then I understand that a lot of the foods that are exceptional for you, it's in how is it being prepared and delivered for someone to fall in love with it and then be able to also fall in love with how they feel when they're on it as well. So like liver, you and I both know, one of the most nutrient dense foods out there. For me, it's all about getting um, satiated through your nutrient capacity versus getting full. And I find that if we meet your, your nutrient needs, your body is no longer hungry for calories searching for nutrients is the way that I try to explain to my clients why they should try liver for the first time when they're resistant. And then they end up eating liver and then loving it and then asking, making requests for it. I, I always screenshot when clients tell me, I hate liver. I'll never eat mushrooms. And then four weeks later, they're requesting. I'm like, hey, remember when you said no mushrooms ever? And here you are. Can I have the shiitake mushrooms again? <laughs> Mushrooms are amazing. And it's like you they they all taste so different. They do. Texturally, they're all so different. They yeah. But if you're if you're the person that thinks, oh, I don't like mushrooms, you really owe it to yourself to challenge that narrative. Yeah. And and most people are familiar with like the the button mushrooms. Um I I love lion's mane, slicing that up and sauteing it. So good. And then shiitake, and maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong is a little bit different than other mushrooms when it comes to the prebiotic fiber capacity of it. Because when you are on a, a like an anti-candida diet, shiitake is the only mushroom that still makes the list. So I found that really interesting mm. when I was putting together my gut reset, because the gut reset is something I put together intuitively for my clients. And then my audience was like, will you please just share anything you do with your clients with us? And I was really nervous about that because having me work one-on-one with an amazing athlete no problem. Fully confident with that. Having me put something into the world scared me. So I was like double, triple, quadruple checking, having my friends test the gut reset. Tell me everything you hated about it. How did you feel? And so I wanted to um, make it something that was great for somebody who was maybe trying to limit sugar. And then I found that shiitake was the one mushroom that passed. And it was the one mushroom that I had as part of my gut reset. And I have those moments of like, did I know that? somewhere or am I like an idiot savant <laughs> like did I get him a download so I mean that's that sounds reasonable I don't really I don't know I don't know enough to, about that to comment on it but it sounds I mean sounds legit <laughs> sounds legit if you speak with conviction that's all that matters <laughs> yeah. this is why you should always cross reference and double check every what everybody says I love that that's true okay so superfood number one because that's what we're that's what we yeah. promised our amazing yes. viewers and, and and listeners here what um uh well I, I guess you've already mentioned too but let's start with liver Yes. Why is liver a superfood? It's got everything you need when it comes to B vitamins and iron. Very, very, very dense. And most people are deficient in that. And I have found that when you apply that to someone, and I'm going to talk to it from like how how they perform, and you can back it up with the, the, the molecules to make someone see because you're really good at that. <laughs> is that what I sound like? <laughs> you just need the glasses. Just the glasses. <laughs> um, so I find that 
they have better oxygen delivery, so they have more energy, more focus. They sleep better for women. Their hormones regulate very quickly. Um, I was working with a running team, and two of the girls on the running team didn't have periods. And I, one of them was willing to eat liver. The other one, we did desiccated liver capsules. Within eight weeks, they both got their periods. One of them was having trouble putting on weight. Um, and her doctor was really happy to see that her body fat percentage was finally increasing to a healthy place. And one of them, her skin completely cleared up. With my male athletes, um, when we're doing focus shots, because I do customized focus shots where based on their body chemistry, I don't love to rely on caffeine. I find people that rely on caffeine for their clients. I, this might be harsh. I find it lazy um, and potentially reckless because depending on how long they're playing, caffeine can actually hinder their capacity to play. So I will do different micronutrients, different mushrooms, and desiccated liver in there too to help with that. And I find that that helps with their 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 ability to play longer. Um, and just in general, you will notice just a, a sense of like things start to work better. It's, it's like a missing piece. Like they get the liver in and all these parts that doctors were trying to treat a different way suddenly fall into place. Wow. And is it, uh, is it beef liver? Is it chicken liver? What's your go-to? My go-to is chicken liver primarily because that's the way we ate it growing up. Mm. And then when I try beef liver, I think I, I just like how um, chicken liver feels. It's more palatable. It's less livery for people. I would agree with that. Um, but I think um, I don't think the nutrient profile is that drastically different among them all. And then we always want to address the whole like liver does not hold toxins. Like everyone's like, oh, you're going to you're going to eat the thing that holds all. I get into this discussion with doctors who are like cardiologist. So what, I mean, no disrespect to your, what you've learned, but like, what do you know about nutrition? It's really frustrating to me, <laughs> but you should know the body function. And so I try to explain to people, liver does not hold toxins. Liver is a processing center, much like USPS. It's telling you where the packages should go. It's not holding it. Cause think about it. If your liver was holding toxins, wouldn't you hit capacity by age one? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if it was holding toxins. So I always have to explain that um, as well to people who might be worried about that. It doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't store toxins. You like chicken liver, right? Or do you like beef liver? Um, I like I mean, I like both, but I would say that chicken I would agree that chicken liver is more palatable and it's like it's it's uh, it's harder to screw up. I feel like it's ve it's very True. easy to screw up. If you're liver. cooking at home. Yeah. Yeah. If you if you overcook beef liver, even like a little bit, it gets rubbery. Yeah, and it's just not not palatable. But chicken liver, I think, is a lot more forgiving. Yeah. From a culinary standpoint. And I put in all these warm and warming spices. So it's it's I call it bang and liver to be funny, but it is just how we make it in Egypt. So it's got cumin, cinnamon, coriander, a lot of warming spices. We'll use ghee or olive oil. So you've got this nice fat that warms with it as well. Um and I do have have clients who are like, what is this? this is so good. I'm like, oh it's liver. No, it's not I hate liver. I'm like, okay, it's carne asada. <laughs> like I don't I don't know what to tell you because they don't realize it can taste that good. You can also take that recipe and when it's cooked, blend it into like a pate with all those those flavors together too. So the whole like thing it, with the red with the green peppers and once everything? it's cooked, yeah. Wow. And then blend that into a paste and then serve it with some crackers. Wow. That sounds good. Pinky up. Yeah. <laughs> Damn. Beef liver is a different animal, literally, literally. and 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 figuratively. <laughs> It's uh you what I do sometimes is I'll go to Whole Foods and I'll get some of it and then you, you just want to sear it in very hot um yeah. either I think ghee tastes the best but I I like to use avocado oil because it it doesn't lend it doesn't have a flavor and it's also I think a healthier fat to use um just being honest and uh and so I like to sear it you got to get the you got to get it really hot so that you get a nice crust on the outside yeah. without cooking, over without cooking. cooking it through yeah I like my liver uh, medium rare. Medium rare, yeah. yeah. I think that's the best. That's the best way to have it. Yeah, and I I prepare mine with olive oil. I don't really love using any dairy dairy products because I have my autoimmune stuff. But you were into ghee for a while, weren't you? I was, and I was trying to figure out why I was still having a response, and it was just like whatever little bit is still in the ghee was giving me problems. And then when I removed it, like I'm I'm not anti any ingredient. I'm very much like what's going to work for you. I was really hoping ghee would still work for me. And every once in a while, once a year, I. I wonder if I can have cheese. Hmm. And then I try it. I'm like, no, you cannot, Mary. And I'll never do that with gluten. That will just knock me out for months. But I'm always hoping that at some point my biome will wow. do something different because I miss a baked brie. 
Wishful thinking, yeah. I suppose. So liver, it's a rich source of multiple vitamins, minerals, also iron. Yeah. There's, um, I think I had sent this to you in my ebook. I have all of the, um, I like to talk about spotlight. So I do an ingredient spotlight and I teach people how to use the ingredient from a culinary standpoint while also teaching them how to use it from a performance standpoint. So there definitely is that like, um, athlete edge, but there's like, this is all the individual ingredients. Oh wow. And then you need a whole section for liver. That's awesome. Cause it's like 3,640% of your recommended, recommended daily value of B12, a thousand percent of your vitamin A and then I talk about helps promote red blood cells and DNA and healthy brain function, immune productive, reproductive and health kidney, 260% of uh, B2 for your cellular development, 65% folate, 30 to 80% iron, copper, choline. Like it is, it is a nutrient dense food. It is. Yeah. It's definitely one of nature's multivitamins. For sure. Um, So cooking it, very smart idea. You have this incredible recipe, banging liver. Um, you can find, you guys can find it online. It's easily it's searchable, right? You can find it on yeah, on yeah, Google. Yeah. It's also in my cookbook, uh, Genius Kitchen. But for along people, with amazing other recipes, yes. <laughs> so the liver can be your gateway, and then you'll be introduced to these beautiful recipes that you have in your cookbook, which I'm very proud yes. of you for. Thank you, and thank you for letting me print your recipe. That's how big of a fan of it I uh, you know that I am. You're discerning. Um, so, but what about for people who maybe their supermarkets don't regularly carry it or they just can't get into eating it? Uh, you mentioned desiccated liver supplements. Yeah. I like, um, or uh, what is our friend's name? The, the, the farm. I always forget their name. So there's supplements. There's two from New Zealand, which I think they have better um, regulations than we mm. do. And then there is... Well, they have no factory farm system there. So if you're getting any kind of beef product from New Zealand, the odds are very high that that the cows are yeah, grass-fed, I, grass-finished. I tend to get things from New Zealand. And then when it comes to like omegas and fish, I try to also mm. reach outside of our country. Um, Paleo Valley. Oh, Paleo Valley. Yeah, yeah they're, yeah, they're great. great. And they also have other vitamins there and they have these beef sticks we, we both know the whole family. They're just really great people. Yes. So you can like really trust them. Yeah. Paleo Valley. Um, they are a sponsor of this podcast, I believe. Oh, that's uh, convenient. <laughs> and they, um, the disc, I think the code is like max. That might be the, the discount code. It's either max or max 15, but they make a great organ complex. Yes. And so I'll use that. And so I, I, I open them up and put them in smoothies or open them up and put them into like, wow. vodka shots. Does it, I mean, does it affect the taste of the smoothie? No. Really? No. Interesting. Oh. That's super good to know. That's yeah. wow. If I can open a capsule, I'll open a capsule. Mm. And then when I'm getting detailed, sometimes I open capsules and reweigh them based on different athletes. Cause like a five foot eight soccer player shouldn't be consuming the same recommended amount as a six foot eight basketball player. Mm. That's a whole other thing. That makes sense. No one <laughs> size fits all. Nope. Uh, okay. So we got liver. Yep. Super excited about that one. What is your next superfood? Black cumin seed. Hmm. So it's got this compound called thymoquinone. I've never heard anybody say it, so I'm really banking that <laughs> that's how you say it. It is very much one of a kind, very high, high anti-inflammatory. And how I said I was introduced as a child, black seeds is part of a very common preserve that we do with Meyer lemon and um, what is the, the little red strings? Uh, saffron. Saffron. Thank you. Um, and that's how we preserve our lemons and, uh, we'll use it colon like in dishes like tagine and stuff, but I would also grind that into a paste and like shoot it as a, a vitamin in the morning. You're getting vitamin C, you're getting the black seed oil oils out of there too. And then, um, and like as a kid, we never really, other than my autoimmune disease, colds weren't really a thing, but I didn't really put all this stuff together as to why, I mean, I'm eating liver and, and black seed oil for fun. And then when I started doing what I'm doing, because prior to this, I was in corporate tech for 10 years and I left to become a performance chef. I don't really have any formal training. There's a lot of self-taught stuff. Um, started utilizing black seeds in the recipes and then also black seed oil, black human seed oil. And researching it, I'm finding all these incredible studies around it helping with um, enhancing uh, an athlete's response to stress. So it's 
future-proofing their stress response to inflammation and also helping with inflammation on the spot. I do know quite a few people who will replace their arthritis medication with black seed oil. Um, it also has anti-candida benefits. It's it's like antiviral, antimicrobial. There's so many pharmacological, is that how you say the word? Yeah. Uh, benefits to it. Um, and it's just like very, there's like such a small case of actual negative side effects of taking it that it's, now that it's getting more popular, it's getting a lot more eyeballs of different ways to use it. For my athletes, I use it um, in common. I use therapeutic doses if they're injured. And then I use it in combination with high dose vitamin C and propolis and making some interesting tinctures with that. You can also use it topically. So it, if there was ever this like, oh my God, this is the, the, the thing I would lean towards black human seeds so much so that I'm working with some, um, developers from Thorn, um, that I'm contracting to actually create a specific, uh, formulation with black seed oil as the star ingredient, um, of the things I've been doing with my athletes, which I'm really excited about. But until then, I um, I source Zatik, Z-A-T-I-C, as their black seed oil because they source from a single farm in Egypt. Um, and yeah, it's, it's again one of those things where I'm like, why am I noticing all these things and then tapping the shoulder of a sports scientist being like, can you validate what I'm, what I'm learning in the field? Because um, again, I take that responsibility very seriously. Does it, uh, so you use it culinarily yes and then you also you your clients will take it as a supplement when needed yeah a tablespoon one to three times a day depending on what we're using it for and for short periods of time and then it is a teaspoon daily just in general well I'm, i do believe in like taking a couple of days off from all supplements if, if especially if ones that are regular and then throwing it into a smoothie if you want and then using the seeds when i'm fermenting things because fermented foods is also part of my clients rotation what does it taste like motor oil it tastes like motor oil <laughs> it's terrible what does it have a relationship with cumin because that's the spice that it's it's black cumin seed so it's it's in the same family as cumin got it but it looks like little it looks like little rocks the seeds they look like little tiny rocks and you'll find them either as the seed or as the oil extract and you do want to as with everything be careful of sourcing and is it typically like cold pressed because i'm assuming that cold it's pressed. it's not like a seed oil like you know we talk about corn oil yeah and, yeah and, uh, and, and rice bran, and, you know, all these like cooking oils right. that undergo extensive processing yeah. to make them, to give them high smoke points and to strip them of, it, of any character, of any character. So, but the, this, this is different. Cold pressed. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it does take, I, I now love the taste. Cause again, it's been part of my, part of my palate since I was a kid, but I always warn people, this tastes terrible. Hmm. So you want to maybe throw it into something. Um, if you are new oh, to it, like you, what kind of recipe that would like would require it? Then? Use the seeds, and you can throw it in over a salad. You can use the I have the the fermented lemon recipes in my gut reset. You can use that, and then take that whole fermented lemon and make a tagine with it. Um, you can use a little bit of the oil. It's got a very like strong peppery taste to it. So complement it when you're creating something. I will sometimes. Do a couple drops in a latte because I do like a like a smoke to my latte, um, or just throw or take. There are capsules if you can't handle the oil. There are capsules you can take, but I will recommend if it's the first time that you're introducing it to your body, do smaller doses like one eighth teaspoons at a time because it's not a common side effect, but some people do get a little nauseous with it, and it's like building up the the experience of that that um, substance in your body and not don't have it on an empty stomach as like I can, I just take the bottle and drink it. But again, 37 years or like, man, I would probably got introduced when I was one. So 36 years of this. Wow. Um, but it's, it's a non-negotiable among my clients. Wow. That's, like, I mean, that's a strong endorsement. I've I, never tried it. I want to try it. I, um, I want to watch you try it. <laughs> it's, it's, it. People are like, what did you do? I, you can, very much like Mary Poppins, you can uh, mix it with some honey. Um, it actually has a chemical reaction with honey that I found that is really uh, a really effective antiviral um, for some really interesting stuff that I, I, I don't necessarily want to say on air because I feel like I'll be crucified. <laughs> um, but it has a really cool chemical interaction. So you can mix it with honey. I like to mix it with honey, propolis, and vitamin C. Um, and uh, I also use it for my skin. And I have to think of like, okay. <laughs> well, and, and propolis has some interesting immune supporting properties as well. Yeah, definitely. That's so cool. Yeah, I want to try it. I've never, I have zero experience with it, but that's why I love talking to you because you're always, you're always talking about some new food. 
that old food. Some old food. It dates back to ancient Egypt. <laughs> yeah. And so, and th- these are the kinds of, kinds of foods that you spotlight regularly on your, on your Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. So I do ingredient spotlights. Um, and again, I, I try to highlight how to use it from a culinary perspective, the benefits. And then I lean towards highlighting how to use it as an athlete or as somebody who trains. Hmm. Cause that's my, my shtick. Um, so it's like, I'll name the ingredient. I'll give you an idea what it tastes like. I'll tell you what it pairs well with, and then I'll tell you the performance aspect and then it's other benefits. But the ones that I repost most often, black seed oil comes up on rotation regularly because I just really want people to be introduced to it and to know the good sourcing for it too. So awesome. And you're a paleo chef on Instagram. Paleo chef, but I believe in paleo. What works for me does not work for you and what works today may not work in six months. Mm, I, I hate like the that. word paleo. Paleo, not paleo, Spanish, but paleo. Wait, so why? You, if you hate the word, why is it in your in your Instagram handle? Timing, luck, and opportunity. When I got paleochef.com and paleo chef across all of the platforms, so it's that's a cool story in itself. It's very serendipitous. And when I tell those stories of how I became a chef and how I got paleo chef as the handle, everyone's like, "Whoa, this is like something divine." Um, and then I came to resent having an avatar and I wanted to have my name. And then I tell people how I got the thing. They're like, no, you got to keep it. So I think it's a really great talking point of like, oh, you're the paleo chef because who knows who Mary Schnute is. Um, and then I go, yeah, they go. So like, like you just th- believe in just eating meat. Right. And I'm like, OK, this is a great opportunity to be like, it's actually paleo you and it's going to be so individualized. So it it does give an opportunity to speak about something more that maybe they wouldn't have asked if it didn't have such a an emotional response to paleo. Yeah, I like that. Was there ever a point at which you were you were consuming the standard American diet? Yeah, um, I didn't start to get sick until first second grade, and I'm talking like hormonal issues, horrible migraines. I had a headache every day from second grade to age 25. ER visits constantly because I'd be throwing up and and pass out. Um, from dehydration and then be rushed to the ER and be accused of what drugs are you taking? And, and so when I'm trying to figure out what happened, I stopped eating primarily at home and started consuming school lunches. So I went from a Mediterranean diet where my mom's making everything to the convenience of school lunches. And then you, I I was an athlete in grade school, junior high and high school. And I was doing what I thought was best whole grain diet soy milk, like, like eating healthy, what I thought was healthy. Now, as a school athlete, a high school athlete, I'm definitely also after practice. This was my rotation. I would go to In-N-Out Burger, get two animal style burgers, a regular burger, animal style fries, a milkshake, then drive to McDonald's, get a fish filet, two cheeseburgers, a McFlurry, then drive to Togo's and get a turkey avocado sandwich, their salad and their peanut butter cookie. And I would just sit on the floor and be so happy. I was playing tennis seven days a week competitively. So like this, I was hungry, but I, I, um, that would happen. And I'm like, no wonder I was having this autoimmune flare up if I ended up having celiac disease or having a response in that way. And, um, and then when I left high school, I didn't want to eat junk food. I wanted to eat more healthy. So that's where I'm like, okay, I want brown rice. I want to have lean cuts of meat. I want to use, uh, certain whey proteins. I want to use NO explode as my pre-workout. And I would, I would feel so proud of myself. I'd get up before my roommates. I'd mix in my protein powder with my soy milk. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm healthy. <laughs> I don't do any of those things anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, oh my God, I used to buy soy milk. Yeah. Back in the day, just because it's like, I mean, I didn't know, I didn't even know what soy was, but it was just like something that was allegedly healthier than yeah. cow milk. Right? Yeah. I think that's where to be so careful with marketing. We are doing, we were making choices that we thought were good based on how things are being marketed to us. And I don't know if you've always been someone who wants to investigate and very like type A about things. I was, but I wasn't with that. Hmm. I was just trusting what a doctor was saying. That's that's why I got my diagnosis for like so late, and it was through my own investigation that I got it. So I was just trusting what doctors were t- telling me to take as far as medications and diet, and that was 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 in our faces. This is healthy. And I'm like, man, <laughs> yeah, so backwards. I remember. I think the the I was I was drinking soy milk for a while, 
this is like early college, probably early college. I was like buying like silk soy yeah, milk, yeah. right? But I would remember, and nothing against silk, but um, I would remember that I started to notice this pattern where I would just con- I would drink a little bit of soy milk, also because I liked the flavor. I thought the flavor was really good, but I would drink a little bit of it, and I would just get this like. I would just be instantly like bloated. I would yeah. feel like a gas bubble just after having like a little bit of of soy milk that like I wouldn't have, I wouldn't experience with any other beverage or anything like that. So you noticed that? Yeah, that was really cool. And then I was like, maybe if I maybe maybe this is well, I didn't I didn't right away connect it to the soy milk, but I thought to myself, what like what like what am I what else am I eating? What's causing this like this weird reaction? And then I put two and two together, a little bit of deductive reasoning, and I. I like a B tested the soy milk and I realized that 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 was what was doing it. And then I stopped drinking it. And then I think at that point I probably made the switch to, I've never been a big, like, you know, cereal eater or milk drinker, but I think I I just transitioned away to like, you know, like an almond milk and unsweetened almond milk. And I've never had those problems. An almond milk. Why do people make fun of the way that I say? I'm not making fun of it. I think it's really endearing. An almond milk. Well, you don't pronounce the L right. Or do you? So I, I thought was, the L was silent. So I, was, I got made fun of online. <laughs> I uh, I think that's an East Coast thing. People were like, "It's your, it's Max's New York accent." Yeah. I, but in, it's not an accent. I think, I actually think that the L is supposed to be silent. So have you ever researched I'm, that to see if it's supposed to be silent? <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> like, do you say "wada" or "water"? I say "water." <laughs> I say "water." Yeah, but I say "almond" because how do you say "antenna"? What do you say "antenna" or "antenna"? Antenna. So I'm parents are Egyptian. I was born in New Hampshire raised in uh, uh, Northern California. And, uh, but I learned how to speak Arabic and English in New Hampshire. And I also did speech therapy, lots of confusion. But if I have a couple of scotches, it's almond, it's New Hampshire, and it's water. <laughs> Cause I'm not enunciating anymore, but that best because it's my East coast. Wow. So I think, I mean, I think it's funny you're saying it's not an accent. You're deliberately leaving. I'm deliberately <laughs> leaving out the L. Guys, let us know, DM me. <laughs> Are you supposed to pronounce the L in al- almond. almond? Almond doesn't it, that sounds weird to me. Is that how you say almond? I now want to say almond. 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 Milk. Almond milk. Almond. <laughs> People were making fun of me. I don't know. I don't know. I, you know. I don't know everything. I'm human. You don't? Definitely not. You ever feel like everyone kind of comes to you for the question because every question? I don't know anything about most things. But do people come to you asking you questions thinking that you do? Um, yeah, I mean, I got people ask me questions all the time. Like, and I have to remind people, like, I'm not a medical doctor. I'm, you people know, ask I know. me every, when I do yeah. and ask me anything, they will ask me diet stuff, relationship stuff. Should I buy a house? Something about their car. I'm like, what on my page makes you think that this is like, dear Mary, like, I don't know how to answer these questions. Even doc- I mean, doctors don't know everything. Like there are specialties. It's yes. a- I think, I think when you're someone who has agency and you speak in such a way, yeah. um, I have to remind myself that they, they may just want your perspective, but, right. but sometimes my, my, and I appreciate that. Yeah. My team, I actually tweeted this, my team, somebody asked me something. I responded on my team and then Kristen goes, hmm, I'm going to Google it. And Nat goes, why are you Googling it? Mary knows everything. And I'm like, I don't know everything. Guys. By the way, doctors use Google. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> yes. Like I, I, at this point, I've got more doctors in my contacts yeah. app than non-doctors. I mean, I'm being hyperbolic, but I've spent enough time around doctors yeah. to know that doctors use Google. But what's so great is when you meet doctors who don't are curious. Don't feel guilty about it. Yeah, no, like curious. I, I tell this when you're to people when they're trying to find a functional doctor or a trainer or anybody. You don't need someone that's smarter than you. You need someone who's more curious than you and insanely curious than you, insanely more curious than you. Because you want someone who's going to be willing to continue to investigate and leave room for the possibility that they're wrong. Yes. That is a good scientist. That's a good investigator. That's a good researcher. Right. So it's, I I think I posted a video about this one doctor being interviewed and he's like, if you ever want to know something about nutrition, don't ask the doctor. And it was a doctor saying it. Well, that's absolutely true. And so- that's a that's a whole other thing. But yeah, I, I have to remind people like I don't I I hardly know what I know because I'm constantly researching. But people do come and ask me questions where I'm like flattered that you think I have a response to this. Well, yeah, I would say that I know a lot about like my lane. Like I'm when I'm in my when I'm in my lane, nutrition, cognitive health, the role of nutrition, mental health, 
fitness, sleep, you know, all the, all that sort of stuff, then yes, uh, I know what I'm, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a good probability that I know yeah, what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, about, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And then it becomes individualized. People, somebody will ask me with no context of who, context of who they are, what they should do with a, an ailment or a food. My response is always, it depends. Here's the generalized information. Yeah. And here's where I'm going to send you to do your own investigation with a, with a doctor so you figure out how it applies to you. So that, I think that's where, um, I think that's what you and I both try to do. We try to teach people how to have agency over their own health and not just rely on listening to one talking point is the, the law of it all. Yeah, well said. Okay, so back to superfoods. We've talked about liver. We've talked about black cumin seed oil. Yep. Can we talk about tahini next? Yes. So tahini, um, it's sesame seeds, which um, ground down into a paste or cold pressed oil, but I'm talking about tahini, the paste. Um, that's how I made fat fudge. It uh, is rich in zinc, magnesium, manganese. It's a really good combination of fats. It's easily digestible. I use it with my athletes um, pregame. So depending on the size and the sport, two to four packets pregame, I will mix it with some proprietary ingredients <laughs> um, for if there's a halftime, a halftime refuel. And then um, different, I put different, um, if we're talking about fat fudge specifically, I put different nutrients in this product um, to maximize either for recovery or pre-workout or pre-workout without caffeine. Yeah. Because I love tahini as a delivery mechanism. Um, and then you had sent me a link and you were like, boom, send, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a study. I don't remember uh, all the details, but somebody had done, a, a group of men had done a 12-hour fast. And then they were given um, tahini, standalone tahini, and then they had some tests done, and it was showing that what came down with their it was their blood pressure and something else, or what was it? I think it was their well. What I re, what I recall is that it was their systolic blood pressure. Um, yeah, I mean, was reduced, was improved. So tahini is the base ingredient of fat fudge, which is of course this this cool product that you've brought to the market. Yes. Um, and I have no financial affiliation, zero, right? Zero. So, I mean, I'll. I'll Although, I, if I if I like go big, I think it's just right as you being such a big supporter <laughs> that I like give a kickback as as a thank you for I'd being get, there through the hard the I'd, hard times. I'd get involved, but um, but it's really tasty. You've got this like the OG version of the product is is like a more chocolate coffee flavor. Yes. Um, and then this, I'm I was super excited when you came out with this halva because yes. that's like that's that was one of my favorite treats growing up, but just. Like all the most of the halva that you'll find on the market is just loaded with sugar. Yeah. And um, on, I, I remember uh, seeing uh, like trans fats, like partially hydrogenated oils and some of the halvas that I was eating like as a kid growing yeah. up. So this is as like, a kid, you were like five years old, and like, hydrogenated oil. <laughs> I learned about that pretty early on. I've always been interested in health. I love that. Yeah. yeah my whole life. So, um, but yeah, but this is dope. Also, to, uh, I'm assuming that tahini is a good source of copper. Yes. Because of the sesame the, seeds. The breakdown on it is... Um, copper can help with iron metabolism, uh, apparently. I haven't, I haven't vetted this, but, um, but copper is something that many of us don't, don't consume. It's important for... Oh my gosh, it's important for so many things. It's important for uh, our antioxidant system in our body. It's important for hair pigmentation. Copper plays an important role. And we don't, eat, we don't commonly eat a lot of foods that are high in copper. No, the, the the actual breakdown of the micronutrients across tahini is pretty impressive for a little tiny seed. Um, vitamin E, rich in iron, vitamin e. calcium, copper, zinc, magnesium, phosphorus. Um, I have more of that broken down. Uh, I'm gonna folic I'm, acid, niacin, riboflavin, thiamine. I love that. Uh, it's like so. It's so. It, again, so interesting. Something that's just so part of my life. Um, and so the way that fat fudge came to be was sort of an accident. Um. I was, if you take the OG flavor, all the spices in there I was using to make lattes for some of my clients. And so those those wow. spices were separate. And then I was trying to make a replacement for protein bars and goo packets. And the best I could come up with was like a powdered um, chia seed with the different nutrients as the delivery system. So in my head, I knew I wanted to make something that was like a squeeze pack because I was trying to do consulting with the Oracle sailing team at the time. Mm. And then I was making halva, or in Egypt we say halawa, I was making that at home. And it's very fickle. If you don't get the timing right on the honey, 
it's going to either solidify or become a fudge. And so I was multitasking, messed up the timing, and I'm like, ah, screw it. So I took the big canister of all these different ingredients that's in the OG, dropped it into the pot, mixed it up, and just set it in the freezer as a fudge. And the next day I'm eating it, and then it's like that download comes. I'm like, wait, if I reduce the honey and increase the tahini and do this with the the different spices, it's now a functional fudge. I called it functional fudge to start. Wow. So that it was it was a divine accident. I'm gonna dive in. I'm taking a spoonful. Yeah, that one's my favorite too because it's very nostalgic. Mm. Wow, it's so thick. I'm gonna spare the audience my <laughs> chewing sound. But. So he's eating it with a spoon because he's proper, but it is just a squeeze pack. It's so good. And you can, um, I made it as a squeeze pack for on the go, pre workout, um, post workout, depending on the different version for. Um, Anyone, not just an athlete. If you're going to work out, if you're in between flights, if you're in the car, I always have some on me as an emergency pack. And uh, some of our customers tell us they blend it into their coffee to make different lattes. They put it in their smoothies. For one of my athletes that needs a, a, a lot of carbs uh, pregame, we put it all over these special waffles I make him. Um, I feel like this could be a good spread on some kind of like uh, gluten-free, grain-free like bread. Yeah, we do that. Um, ice cream. Topping. I did that for one of my pop-ups. Oh, that sounds incredible. Yeah, wow. we did that for one of my pop-ups. What's it, uh there's a discount code if people want to try this out, right? I think we I think it was genius is what you had it as. I think so, yeah. That yeah. makes sense. Yeah. If not, show notes. At where? Paleo. I mean that's uh, fat fudge. P H A T fudge dot com. Cool. Genius fat fudge dot com. Yeah. Um and again, I, I started with making it for clients and athletes, but the use cases that come back are just really fascinating. Moms are using it during labor firefighters are using it police officers are using it uh doctors are using it during long surgeries um different people who are going through more serious treatments and have trouble keeping on weight will use that during those treatments so it's been really cool and then what i think is awesome that we do is i have my my core team and then we hire um exclusively from a boys home um to help grow fat fudge. And it's just really cool teaching them how nutrition plays a role in their sobriety and helping support them in that way too and watching them graduate. So it's 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 something that I'm really proud of because it's something that I started with $600 out of my apartment. I grew it and now I'm doing my best to help grow other people in that process too. Wow. It's so good. It's so tasty. It feels nourishing. It's like rich and satiating. Yeah. So even now, if I'm hungry and I'm on the go and I'll grab one and eat it, I'm like, man, this is such a good product. <laughs> Even after all this time, I'm still impressed with my own product. And it's also like a, I mean, it's like a, you know, halva is a candy typically, right? Typically. And this has got two or three grams of sugar, depending on the version. So you've got OG that has the equivalent of one coffee bean, which is 10 milligrams of, of caffeine. I'm very much about the minimal effect of dose. And people mm. are like, wow, I feel a lot of energy. How much caffeine is in this? And I'm like, well, it's the combination of the healthy fats, the maca, and a little bit of caffeine. You've got a DAP that has reishi and ashwagandha. So that's a regulator. I know we're going through a lot of different ingredients, not just the ones that we're highlighting on the show. Um, and this one's good for before bed or in the afternoon. And then there's a strawberry version that has beets in there and cordyceps. Wow. So that's a way to get, um, some power and endurance without any caffeine whatsoever. And so depending on my clients, sometimes we'll mix the chocolate and the strawberry before a game, or we'll do just the chocolate. That's awesome. But it's not necessarily, it's not only indicated for like pregame, right? Like no, no, no. Any time of day. It, these are all any time of day, but if you know enough to be to be like a little bit dangerous, you can be more deliberate with the uses out there. I'm gonna crack open this. Um, and and while I'm doing that, okay, so we've talked about we've talked about liver, we've talked about black seed oil, um, tahini. Tahini. What's the next superfood to reduce inflammation and promote longevity? Do we want to talk about? Well, I really love what maca does for your blood and for your endurance. What's and maca? Maca is a root. It's an adaptogen. Really can help with um, endurance and uh, as well as hormone regulation. And so when I think about longevity, I think about ways that you improve your your ecosystem. So maca is something that most of my clients also get, and it's also in in fat fudge. This is bomb. I know. <laughs> this is sweeter and it has a more. It's like the consistency is different. So it it's very much respecting 
the integrity of the ingredients. Mm. So the reason why halva is halva is because it complements reishi and ashwagandha. The reason why strawberry is strawberry is because strawberry complements beets. This feels sweeter because this has cinnamon in it. So it highlights the sweetness of the honey. Wow. That's okay. so good. Jesus Christ. Yeah. And any product that I make in this whole family and the other products we're coming is like, there'll never be a birthday cake version of this. Right. It's it's very much of like, what are the star ingredients and how do I make the flavor complement around that? That's where it's cool that I have this culinary perspective as well as the performance perspective. Also, I get to test it on some of the greatest athletes in the world before I bring it to market. It's a nice perk. Yeah. Um. So there's maca in this. Yes. Maca in that one and maca in the strawberry one. Um, like I said, hormone regulator, um, it is really good for endurance. It's really good for focus. Um, it's Isn't really maca also a, uh, a blood stabilizer and you're going to go there, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> it's an aphrodisiac. I just saw the mischievous <laughs> smile <laughs> forming. Yes. It's a natural. Yes. Is it an aphrodisiac? It, um, yeah. If you, if you take a specific dose of maca as a man, you will be saluting very easily. Really? Yes. Wow. And um, and it's interesting uh, with infertility in men, maca and black seed oil help with that. Interesting. You can mix the two. There is there a, because I've seen different kinds of maca on the market. There's like a gelatinized. Gelatinized, uh, raw, black, red. Mm. There's so many different kinds. All of them have slightly different uses. Um, people say gelatinized is more bioavailable. I believe the black and the red maca help with... Um, regulating uh hemoglobin wow and um all of them do help with endurance and testosterone for some women with pcos it could make things worse that's where i'm like everything depends um and so always do that that underlying research but it is it is something that unless we find um something in the blood work that says you shouldn't have it it is across the board across all my athletes wow amazing yeah and they'll know and what's interesting is my clients will notice a difference when they have it, but then they will notice a marked difference if they go without it. Like there was one week, one of my athletes had to travel without me and complaining, it's not the same without this and da, 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 da. and it's, it's, I didn't do it on purpose, but I'm like, well, that's a really great selling point for me that you notice the absence of these different ingredients hmm. in your food. Now, can you buy maca as like a standalone uh, supplement or powder, like how is it typically consumed? You can get it in powder form and just add it to coffee, teas, smoothies. Does it does it stir into coffee? It's a little gritty, hmm. so I would add it with like a collagen or a creamer, or like I I like blending tahini hmm. as a creamer. Um, so not necessarily fat fudge, but you can just get tahini and blend it. But it is a little gritty; um, it doesn't dissolve. And then there's capsules too. If somebody wanted to do capsules, wow. Do you use maca? I was, I do, I have it in my house. I'm trying to remember what I, what I bought it for. Um, probably to put into like smoothies because it has a, the taste. I like the taste. I lot. love the taste. Not everyone it's loves very, that it's taste. It's like kind of sweet. It's for, it's to me, it's a sweet and a smoke. Hmm. So I can taste the sweetness of a very sensitive palate, but it also has a little bit of like, the best way I can describe it, a little bit of smoke to it. Hmm. Like if I were to make a cocktail with it, I would definitely interesting lean towards a smokier drink with that. You know why I think I have some in the house? I did a we did a partnership a couple of years ago with Navitas mm -hmm. and uh, Navitas, Navitas and um, <laughs> almond, <laughs> and they uh, they sent me a bunch of different products, and so I remember wanting specifically requesting that because I'd read about I'd read about all the benefits, and then I think I remember okay, it's coming back to me. I was on I did the doctor's TV show where I was talking about I was talking about some of the research underpinning it. It's a cruciferous vegetable, is it not? Oh, I didn't know that. I, I think maca? maca might be, yeah. I know it's a root, but I didn't know those in the cruciferous family. I think it is. I think it is. Correct me if I'm wrong. Somebody definitely will. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody always corrects me if I'm wrong. So um, I, think, I think it is, though. Uh, yeah, very cool. Um, I would, so I know, like, for example, you said you didn't sleep well last night. It, it would be interesting to use maca for seven to 10 days upon rising and then use ashwagandha seven to 10 days um, in the afternoon or before bed and see if it regulates. Because I was I was saying to you before this, uh, I wonder what your cortisol pattern is like because there's some 
uh, disre- dysregulation of patterns that are actually common dysregulations. And I'll use ashwagandha in conjunction with maca to try to regulate that along with breath work and other things. But it'd be interesting since you haven't been using it to use it strategically and see if you notice a difference. So you would recommend what maca in the mornings? Yep. Because it's more energizing? Yes. And then ashwagandha? Evening or before bed. Mm. Like I have a sleep tonic that I put together uh, for clients. That's ashwagandha, a little bit of honey, a little bit of reishi, salt, and some almond. Wow. Yeah. You are, you're, you're like a modern day alchemist. Yeah. I, yeah, I guess. <laughs> I mean, like mixing all these concoctions and these spices and these herbs and. Oh yeah. When somebody, like I, I posted something a while ago, one of my clients was, it was feeling just slightly under the weather. And I'm like, we got to jump on that real quick. And I, mm-hmm. I'll use metrics like using the the tracker, the aura ring to see what's going on with their body ahead of time. I have a, I have a really cool coach's view. So I have all my clients in these cool charts and graphs so I can see what's happening. And as, as, as soon as they open their phone on their end, I have the data. So I, I noticed that some of his markers were coming down. And I, I, again, very intuitively brewed this really cool tea that he, we cold brewed and had it in the fridge. And within 24 hours, he was back on the field. Wow. And and then that's again where I'm like, okay, let me let me take this concoction over to a scientist and like, can you tell me what I did? That's cool. <laughs> so I get ner- I get nervous saying that because we're so like, you should ask for proof of things, but I think you know some people find the proof through like we need people who experiment, and I guess I'm I'm a field, ex- someone who's in the field experimenting and then using the the data to back it up. Like I think you need both sides of things. So you know I don't always. Again, doing this for 10 years, I know a lot, but also I do do a lot of things intuitively and then never recklessly, but then back it up. But it's not always the the best selling point. Like I'm an intuitive alchemist. No, but I mean, (laughs) Mary, intuition is such a crucial ingredient in this whole thing. You've got to have a good, uh, a strong intuition and you've got to use that intuition. Thank you. I'm, I'm doing my best with that. Yeah. Uh, with food and then also just navigating um because while while I talk about health on my social my social is more so I'm just leading a life by example and that is not just food it's building a business it's being a young woman it's 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 very much of like all the decisions I've made my high school dropout I moved out when I was 17 and I don't preach, but I share my thought process around things. And a lot of decisions, I mean, people are like, how did you make that decision? I'm like, my gut told me to. I'm just listening to the the signs. I did a podcast with Create the Love, Mark Groves, and he named it Responding to the Call because he was talking about talking to me about how did I come to be where I am now? And he's like, if you weren't listening to your intuition and paying attention to the signs, you would have completely missed the boat on this. Word. I agree. Um, number five. We want to talk about beats. Let's talk about beats. Give me a beat. Give me a. <laughs> oh, snap. I didn't oh, know you had that damn. talent. <laughs> I love beats. Also part of my gut reset. Um, I use beet juice in combination with other cold pressed juices as part of a pre-workout drink. Again, using minimal effective dose. But it's a, a, it's a blood enhancer. It's the uptick of your NO. It's It's really, really powerful and people don't like it. And I think, again, I think it's another ingredient or food that is not properly prepared or put in combination with other things for people to get its full benefits. Beets are 10 out of 10. I love beets. Me too. What I don't know, or maybe I do know this, red beets are different than golden beets. The first time I ate beets, I didn't know that it makes your pee and everything <laughs> and my favorite and, phone call and everything else <laughs> yeah. red yeah. i called my mom <laughs> and i was like mom i think my intestines are bleeding <laughs> and uh she asked me if i had eaten beets recently and yeah. i said yes i occasionally forget to tell my clients that and i get the call the next <laughs> day of like I don't know if this diet's working and i'm like oh i'm so sorry i forgot to tell you beets will do that to you yeah but they're so good. Okay, you mentioned NO. What is that? Uh, nitric oxide hmm. um, helps with um, 
the oxygen delivery to your blood and your mental focus. And again, your endurance, again, for our athletes, we'll use that as the precursor for that. Um, so sometimes if somebody is, again, this takes some intuition and some testing, but if you're really run down um, and your endurance is lacking, but you're eating right and other things are making sense, it could be an oxygen delivery issue. And if you want to treat it using some using foods, beets are a great um, use of that. Also for um, elevation training, if you use beets eight to 10 days, eight ounces a day before that, it actually helps you in elevation. There's other studies that show uh, training for big races, big games. My clients are using it every single day. So we're, we've got that covered. But like if you're going to do a marathon, eight to 10 days of eight ounces of beet juice beforehand can, I think the percentage was like 10%. Again, I think someone will correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it helps with that endurance uptick in the focus. Um, and then how I say it's paleo, you, and we talked about this before the podcast is you're making your best, your best guess with the information that, you know, beets are amazing for that. And I had an athlete where we were having, um, indications of hypoxia and we're like, okay, well, what's going on? Is he eating enough, eating at the right intervals? What is he eating? Okay. We're, we're giving him the right ingredients. Beets are part of every single day. So what is it? Then we do a blood serum test, uh, and we find that is number one inflammatory food, boom, beets. Wow. So we think we're doing something great. And this is why I really, really lean into blood testing and really comprehensive testing because then, again, this is an athlete that I need him on the ball. So we immediately replace the beets with turnips. Thank you, Andy and Dan, because they help, <laughs> they help me discover that. Turnips also contain nitrates? They help with that uptake too, yeah. Yeah. And so replacing that, so now I'm cold pressing turnips and including turnips in his wow. diet and within like a week notices the difference. Something really interesting is that um, humans, we don't actually produce the enzyme required to reduce nitrate, which is what is found in beets and in other uh, produce, like arugula and I'm guessing turnips, arugula, um, yeah. to uh, to nitrite, which is what enters the nitric oxide pathway. We, re we rely on oral bacteria to do that. And so that's why for one, you should chew your food slowly. I mean, for many reasons, but for that reason, because you, you need to give your oral bacteria time to yeah. do that conversion. I have a video of me chewing food showing how long this is you should chew your food. Yeah, it's super important. But also that's, a, I think, a reason, and I talked about this, I was on Mind Pump recently. I think one of the reasons why you don't always see the nitric oxide boosting and the performance boosting effect of these beetroot uh, drinks these extracts because you just you stir it into a drink and then you drink it really quickly right so you're you're not giving your oral bacteria time to do the job that's why food I think trumps the uh, the effect that we see when when giving food to athletes trumps sure. the effect of these supplements sure but if you were to take a supplement and maybe swish it in your mouth yeah you probably see a bigger effect. I talk about swishing and mimicking chewing mm. even with smoothies and drinks with with my clients. Um, also, we don't let them use mouthwash. Right. <laughs> we go through that process of like what's happening in your environment that is also impeding the ability for you to optimize the use of food as as a supplement or nutrition. You get way. your athletes off off the mouthwash. Oh, they get off the mouthwash. Yeah. <laughs> I've been talking about that a lot recently. Yeah. Yeah, it's super important. Yeah. Not all mouthwashes are bad, but it's yeah, the yeah. antiseptic ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was something that I learned working with sports scientists over the last couple of years because you don't even think that. And I'm, and I'm usually the person that's walking through their house like, that's got to go. You can't use this. Da, 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 da. And I know it sounds extreme, but we're dealing with professional athletes. So like those details matter. Yeah. But they're the ones that the sports scientists helped me figure that out and pointed that out to me, which I think is really powerful. Um, we, we went through five. We went through five. Because I have a bonus one I want to bring up. You've got a bonus. Well, I've got two bonuses. That's so generous of you. I am a very generous person. Because um, we were talking about, you know, what is it in your environment, the mouthwash, and what came to mind was um, the other performance, longevity, whatever you want to call it, is the ability to express emotion, human connection, and compassion. It made me think of, you were there at that panel up in Portland. Remember mm. we went to that with um, Max Artsis and all those other coaches? Yeah. I don't know if you were there for, well, you were there, I think, for the the panel where they were doing the Q&A 
Totally forgot you were there. Yeah, I think I was there. And Max goes... Was it um, Roan or something? Roan, yeah. And it was a bunch of... It was for a lot of clinicians. So there was trainers in the room. Just yeah. for anyone who's listening, it was trainers, coaches. Um, That's when I met Vinny of Myo Detox, right? Yep, and yep. also Teddy of... Teddy? Yeah, no. Yeah, I'm trying to remember his Instagram name, though. Teddy something. Yeah. Um, Teddy strength coach and something or other. Yeah, yeah. So I remember um, Max, the other Max, had asked me on our panel... What's the number one nutrient deficiency you see among all your clients? And I was like, the number one deficiency I see among all my clients, not just athletes, is a lack of compassion, human touch, and connection. Because it really doesn't matter what I'm feeding someone. If you don't have that, your body's not going to optimize the use of, of the food it has because it's stuck in a different pattern. Hmm. And so the other part of performance that we do with, with my clients is um, you know, practicing breath work, getting your body to trust itself again, getting it out of that fight or flight. Um, and I think it's really, really overlooked because you might be thinking you're doing everything right with food and you're still having issues. And that issue could be related to something else, more emotional, mental that needs to be tended to. So is that the sixth superfood? Compassion? Compassion. Wow. <laughs> I love that. Hey guys, if you enjoyed that conversation, you're gonna love this one. A lot of the foods in the mainstream diet are very pro-inflammatory, and that includes a lot of the fats and oils that are used, especially uh, vegetable oils with a uh, high content of polyunsaturated fatty acids. It includes quick digesting carbs, uh, you know, things with made with flour and sugar. Um, so a lot of the manufactured, processed, refined foods, these are all pro-inflammatory. And I think that's where you want to start is trying to eliminate all of those things as much as possible. What What is it about refined grain products, uh, quote unquote, inflammatory oils? Can you define what those oils are, where where they're hiding in the food supply? What What is it about those foods? Okay, let's do the oils first. Okay. And there are different kinds of fatty acids. There are saturated ones, which we used to think were bad for the heart uh, and probably aren't so bad. There are monounsaturated fatty acids, which are predominant in olive oil, and that's those are very good for us. And then there are polyunsaturated fatty acids, which are very susceptible to oxidation mm. and degradation if they're exposed to heat, light, and air. And when they degrade, they form carcinogenic pro-inflammatory compounds. And most of the oils in the American diet are of that sort. They're refined vegetable oils uh, that are very high in these polyunsaturated fatty acids and easily break down to pro-inflammatory compounds. Wow. And where, where are they typically found? I mean, what kinds of foods, foods are they typically found in? All manufactured food. You know, we've made uh, refined soybean oil very cheap through uh, federal subsidies. So it is a universal commodity crop and it's in all manufactured foods. Wow. Yeah. Big, big problem. And also, I, I feel like restaurants are probably very prone to using them because they're dirt cheap. Absolutely. So we need alternatives to them. And But with the carbs, it's a different matter. It's that when you refine carbohydrates into forms that quickly digest into sugar and raise blood sugar, uh, that provokes inflammation by a different mechanism. Interesting. Is it a, is there a, a, is it sort of a scenario of the dose making the poison? I mean, is a, is a little bit here and there. Sure. I mean, okay. I think that's true of, of most things. Uh, but at the moment, the mainstream diet is very overloaded and top heavy in these pro-inflammatory elements. Wow. And what, what exactly is inflammation? Because I mean, you're a medical doctor, you hear the term inflammation thrown about quite a bit in the online health and wellness space. Mm -hmm. But I think, um, lay people, uh, maybe could use a bit of a crash course on what, what it actually is from the standpoint of our physiology. Well, it's very simple. We all know inflammation on the surface of the body. It's local redness, heat, swelling, and pain at an area that's been injured or is under attack. And inflammation is the body's way of getting more nourishment and more immune activity to an area that needs it. But inflammation is so powerful and it's so potentially destructive that it's very important that it stay where it's supposed to stay and end when it's supposed to end. If inflammation persists, if it serves no purpose, it becomes productive of disease. So the body has very complex mechanisms for being able to produce enough inflammation to protect you um, and not enough inflammation that it's going to cause problems. So these are delicate balances of hormones and regulatory compounds. If you can't produce enough inflammation, you are susceptible to infection mm. and poor wound healing. If you produce too much, this can spill over into allergy and into autoimmune disease. But most interesting, it looks as if 
many of the most serious chronic illnesses begin as inflammatory processes. So it's low level chronic purposeless inflammation that you need to be concerned about. So it's it's really our immune systems reacting to our diets, whereas in 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 antiquity, historically, our immune systems would ha- have had to ha- have evolved to respond to physical physical threat. Right. It's not entirely diet because there are many factors that influence your inflammatory status. One is genetics. Another is stress. Uh, another is exposure to environmental toxins. For instance, secondhand cigarette smoke is strongly pro-inflammatory, for example. Uh, so, but diet is a major one, and that's one we have control over. So that's the one you want to look at because, as I said, the mainstream diet is strongly pro-inflammatory. It gives us all the wrong things and not enough of the right things that are protective. I feel like for people when they're healthy, chronic disease is sort of an abstract concept. So are there any short-term consequences to inflammation wrought by diet and lifestyle? Well, as I said, allergy, autoimmunity, inflammation of joints, and those are all obvious things. But the, the big concern is that this low level purposeless inflammation may be setting the stage for very serious diseases that you develop you know, after midlife, things like coronary artery disease, which begins as inflammation in the arteries, uh, Alzheimer's, which begins as inflammation in the brain. And cancer is related too, because anything that increases inflammation simultaneously stimulates cells to divide more frequently. You can't separate those, those two things. Uh, aspirin is a, has pr- cancer protective effects because it is an anti-inflammatory agent. So, you know, this is all linked. When I was in medical school, I was taught that coronary artery disease and cancer and neurodegenerative diseases, these are completely separate disease forms that have nothing in common. And now it looks as if there's this common thread in inappropriate inflammation. And the good news there is if that's a common element, then there's common strategies for dealing with it. Absolutely. It gives us agency, which is what I love so much about your about your work. Is there any effect that inflammation has on on the burning of fat um, and and weight loss? I think if you're in a an inflammatory state, you are more likely to put weight on and it's more difficult to come off. Interesting. Tell us about your background. You are one of the world's most respected physicians. You are one of the most prominent figures in the field of integrative medicine. You've been doing this for decades at this point. How did you get into, um, what got you interested in medicine and how did you then come to find integrative medicine and, and, and what really is integrative medicine? Okay. Well, those are big questions. Yeah. I'm always interested in science and biology. Uh, my family doctor, who was a general practitioner, was an influence on me, wanted me to go into medicine. Wow. I, I never saw myself practicing medicine, but I thought I'd want a medical education. It seemed to me that would be very useful to me. So you didn't uh, want to do residency, but you wanted the MD. Is that kind of... Yeah, I thought that would be useful. And also... Uh, I, I had too many interests and people were always after me to say what I wanted to be. And I didn't know. And it, it, it drove me crazy. So when I said I was going to medical school, it made everyone go away. Um, also, it was during the Vietnam War and it was a way of not dealing with that. You know, I got the deferment for all those years in school. At any rate, um, I had before I went to medical school, I studied botany. And that's an unusual combination. Uh, so as an undergraduate at Harvard, I majored in botany and I had the good fortune uh, to study under the man who would, who really created the modern field of ethnobotany, Richard uh, Schultes, mm. and he stimulated me an interest in medicinal plants. So I entered medical school with that background and I was very shocked to see that the people teaching me pharmacology had no knowledge of the plant sources of the drugs that they were teaching about and how they differed from isolated chemicals. Uh, I also had a long-standing interest in the mind and the body and how they interacted. And I, I got nothing about that in medical education. I think that's one of the big omissions in conventional medicine. And then when I finished my clinical training uh, in an internship, I didn't want to practice that kind of medicine. I saw it do too much harm, especially in the form of adverse drug reactions. And 
it didn't teach me anything about how to keep people healthy. You know, I really didn't learn nothing about health and healing. And it seemed to me that the main business of doctors should be to teach people how to live in order not to get sick in the first place. So I was very disillusioned. I dropped out of medicine for a number of years. I made my living as a writer. I found ways to travel around the world and look at healers and alternative practitioners of all kind. I did that for about three and a half years. And then my car broke down in Tucson and I never left. And, uh, uh, you know, I, the University of Arizona found out that I was there. They asked me if I would begin giving lectures at first on uh, cannabis because nobody on the faculty knew anything about it. And I had done the first uh, human double blind experiments with it in 1968. Wow. Um, and then I began giving some lectures on addiction. And I said, look, I really want to talk about alternative medicine. Nobody even knew what that was in those days in the 70s. So I started giving lectures in the medical college at the University of Arizona on things like chiropractic and osteopathic medicine and Chinese medicine. Um, and I gradually put my own ideas together. Uh, and people started showing up at my doorstep wanting me to treat them. Uh, so I gradually got drawn into practice. I called what I did natural and preventive medicine at first, and then I came to call integrative medicine. Wow. So you, you basically invented the field. Yeah. Long time ago. Wow. And for uh, many years, nobody paid any attention to me. Uh, I got a, a larger and larger following in the general public, but no medical colleagues listened to what I was saying. And that didn't change until the early 1990s. And that was when the economics of healthcare began to go south. And the lesson that I draw from that is that no amount of ideological argument moves anything. It's only when pocketbooks and institutions get squeezed that they begin to open up to new ideas. Interesting. I think a lot of physicians are um, are evidence based, which is a good thing, obviously. Yeah, that's good. But they are, but 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 many also are evidence bound, which I think is not necessarily a good thing. I couldn't agree more. I think in its in its most extreme form, the evidence-based medicine movement is analogous to religious fundamentalism. It's scientific fundamentalism. And there are situations now where you're not allowed to give a lecture in a medical institution unless you previously submit what you're going to say and have references in journals that are approved by the evidence-based medicine committee. And also doctors can't do treatments that aren't approved by the evidence-based medicine committee. And those are always interventions, drugs. You know, there's a big, uh, it's a big tangled mess involving medical journals, the pharmaceutical companies, the healthcare institutions. You know, doctors are no longer, they've lost their autonomy and they're told how they have to practice. Well, I feel like the evidence-based model does prevent healthcare from becoming the wild, wild west, right? Where, where we like to think that, but you know, when you look just at medications, uh, all of this insistence on double blind trials has not kept a great many worthless and dangerous drugs off the market. Mm. So, you know, it's not, it's, it is not a, a, it's not a perfect system by any means, but here's what I teach about evidence to the doctors that I train. I think we should use a sliding scale of evidence that works like this. The greater the potential of a treatment to cause harm, the stricter the standards of evidence it should be held to for efficacy. If, if you know, I teach everybody breathing techniques, they, there's not a lot of published evidence on the efficacy of breathing, but I know from my own experience how valuable this is and the potential to cause harm is, is negligible. So I'm quite comfortable recommending that until we begin to get more evidence. And the reason why we don't have uh, requisite the, the requisite amount of evidence to convince the most ardent evidence based practitioners is that who's going to fund a study on on breath work? Exactly. Or if people are even interested in it, you know, you try to talk to uh, average physicians and scientists about breathing. It's too simple. You know, there's no device. There's no substance. How possibly could this affect anything? Interesting. And you've seen it perform oh, amazing i mean i i teach a very simple technique called the 478 breath you can find it on on youtube i i have seen miraculous changes in people from practicing this in terms of lower blood pressure improved digestion improved circulation i mean all sorts of things from a high level what what, what does that technique uh, entail uh, you breathe in through your nose quietly to a count of four hold your breath for a count of seven and blow air out through your mouth to a count of eight and you do that four breath cycles, that's it. Uh, and you have to do it at least twice a day, but you got to do it religiously. And it changes 
the balance of tone in the involuntary nervous system. It increases parasympathetic tone, decreases sympathetic tone, and that has far reaching effects on, uh, on all functions of the body. What does it mean to, um, to increase parasympathetic tone? Okay. So, you know, the involuntary nervous system has two divisions. One that speeds things up, which is the sympathetic nervous system. That's the one that mediates the fight or flight response and the parasympathetic nervous system slows things down. Uh, and these two have to be in balance. And in most people in our culture, there's too much sympathetic tone and not enough parasympathetic tone. So you want to activate that. That's the relaxation response. There's lots of ways of doing it, but breath control is one of the simplest and most effective. That's amazing. Wow. Yeah. When, I, when I think of tone, I think of a, a muscle that's been exercised. Well, same thing with the nerve with nerves. It's like how, what frequency are they operating at? Uh, so if there's increased tone and in, in a division of the nervous system, there's more firing, more activity. Wow. Would you say that integrative medicine really um, is about the intersection between the, the mind and the body? That's one big component of it. I think it's much more than that. It's the intelligent combination of conventional medicine and natural and preventive strategies, emphasis on lifestyle. But mind-body medicine is a big piece of it. And that's one that's been neglected totally in conventional training. What role does the mind play in systemic health? <laughs> I think you can't, you can't disentangle the mind and the body. They're two hmm. poles of the same thing. Uh, the only way you can separate them is verbally. Uh, anywhere there is, anywhere there are nerves, there is potential up to for mind to create an influence. So I think there's no system of the body that's not out of the range of, of, uh, what goes on in your mind. And when something changes in your body, that's reflected in changes in the mind. So there is this back and forth continuous interaction. And you want to take advantage of that in medicine because the strategies that are available for you, you taking advantage of the mind-body connection are very cost-effective, very time-effective. They're even fun for both practitioner and patient, and they're totally underutilized in medicine today. And that includes things like hypnosis and biofeedback and guided imagery. I mean, there's a whole range of mind-body techniques. Most people underappreciate that I would say that the vast majority of underappreciate the fact that the mind can actually have an effect on one's <laughs> predisposition to cardiovascular disease or to forms, various forms of dementia or um, autoimmunity. But you're yeah. saying that, that it actually it does play a role. <laughs> it's a huge role. I studied medical hypnosis, uh, took a course for physicians at Columbia University after I finished my internship, one of the best courses I've ever taken. And I saw demonstrations in that that were mind blowing, you know, things like you can a good hypnotic subject, you can touch them with a finger, tell them it's a piece of hot metal, they get a blister. Wow. And you do the opposite. You can touch a person with a hot piece of hot metal and tell them it's not hot and they don't get a blister. I mean, that's all you need to see to know how powerful that connection is. In your experience, is, is everybody hypnotizable? Because I've never been hypnotized. There's a range. You know, there is a range of susceptibility. There are some people about, general figures are that 20% of us are highly hypnotizable, 20% are relatively not hypnotizable, and the rest of us are somewhere in between. But even for the ones who are not very hypnotizable, there are ways of, of taking advantage of that. You know, it's just putting you in a focused state where your scope of your awareness is reduced, but the intensity is increased. When you're watching a movie, you're in a light trance state. And when you're in that kind of state, the, the channels between the mind and the body are, are open. Uh, I work with a very skilled hypnotherapist and he's on our faculty at our center of integrative medicine. And he once said to me, and I've come to believe this absolutely, that he thought that every a uh, skin disorder and every GI disorder should first go to hypnotherapy before you go to dermatologists or gastroenterologists, because those two systems of the body have the highest ratio of nerves, uh, tissue, and they're the most frequent sites of expression of mind body imbalances. So people can have, so, so, so skin problems can be a manifestation of a mind body imbalance. Absolutely. No, that's, you have to be careful in how you present this to people because you don't want to give them the impression that you think their disease is unreal or that they are mm. creating it with their mind. That's not the point. The point is that there's just this back and forth and you can take advantage of that connection. 
I just can't remember the last time I've been to a dermatologist and they asked me about how I was doing mentally. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, you know, with the GI stuff, all you have to do is if you were in a student health center at exam time to see the number of people that come in with diarrhea, vomiting, digestive upsets and stress from, you know, that period in their lives. What are some daily habits then that you think could be useful for our, for our viewers and for our listeners to, to support mental health, which I, I, I'm, I'm hearing from you plays a, a large role in systemic health, our risk for chronic disease, our, our predisposition, predisposition to weight gain. What are some daily, daily habits that people should really um, tr attempt to adopt? I think everyone should learn and practice some method of neutralizing the harmful effects of stress on the mind and the body. There's a wide range of choices, everything from guided imagery, relaxation, yoga. I personally like breath control because it's so time efficient. And as I said, that four, seven, eight breath that I teach, it takes 30 seconds. You just have to do it twice a day religiously, and it produces marvelous effects. Physical activity is, a, it, I think, some, has to be a component of everybody's life. Walking can satisfy that need if you do enough of it and, and uh, you know, do it aerobically enough. I think getting adequate rest and sleep, uh, that's a very key component of a healthy lifestyle. Uh, so, you know, those are some basic ones in addition to paying attention to your diet. Hey, if you like that video, you need to check out this one here and I'll see you there. We're getting to know that there's this incredibly important language between the gut microbiome and our mitochondria that's completely lost uh, when we stop feeding these guys what they need to eat.